everyone. I'm Tom. Uh, I'm supposed to remind you that uh, you'll get an email after this talk to uh, rate me if, if you'd like to. Um, and please do uh, take the time to do that. I would love to get the feedback uh, whether uh, you like this kind of content, um, whether you think this is useful. Uh, this is kind of a wacky, vaguely personal subject to me. Um, and I'm not really sure uh, how much interest there is in this sort of uh, really, to me, special group of players, because we're not the biggest scene around. Um, so the feedback would really help me, so I'd appreciate it. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's see. Like I said, I'm Tom. I've been involved in competitive gaming esports for over 25 years now. First as a player, as what amounted to a pro back in the early 90s. I was a fanatic Street Fighter player, uh, traveled the country, going to tournaments. Uh, my mains were Chun-Li and Dalsam, just in case you're curious. They're still my mains. Uh, in 2011, I dove into the games industry as a developer, uh, co-founding a little startup called Radiant uh, with my twin brother and co-founder. Uh, there we produced our own fighting game, uh, had a brief alpha for about six months. That game was called Rising Thunder. And we later sold that company to Riot Games. But in the background for the past 15 years, I've been uh, sort of developing this project called Evo uh, with a couple of awesome partners. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. And let's get to it. So this is a really quick timeline. I want to talk about a special group of players for me. Uh, it's called the FGC, the fighting game community, and talk about why I think they're special in the world of esports. Um, I want to describe how they got that way and describe most of my talk uh, on that subject. And then I'll contextualize it for how it matters if you're building a game or how if you want to be in, involved in esports. OK, so behold, this is the FGC. How many people know what this is? Show of hands. Oh, good, most of you. OK, so this can go fast. Um, so uh, the FGC, for maybe those of you who are, are, are seeing this for the first time, is a group of really passionate fighting game fans who have organized themselves into basically a global collection of grassroots tournaments. So on any given weekend throughout the year, you'll see tournaments for Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Guilty Gear, um, all kinds mm -hmm. of fighting games happening um, all over the world, uh, the US, EU, uh, Japan. Um, and the largest of these uh, events is EVO. And this is the event uh, that I help run. It's kind of the de facto annual championship of fighting games. We hold nine tournaments throughout a weekend. Uh, and players really show up to this thing. Last year, we had over 10,000 players show up uh, from over 70 countries. And what's unique about this scene and EVO is that Almost all of these tournaments are open. They have open brackets. Uh, anyone who wants to come can play and compete against the best in the world, regardless of your skill level. OK, so why, why is that important? Why does it matter? Well, when we think about eSports events, we usually think about something like this. And these are legitimately awesome. Uh, I love going to these. I love watching them. But uh, the draw of this event is to watch the pros play at the very highest level. It's that spectacle of seeing the best of the best of the best compete. And most of the people in this stadium probably play this game. Most of them are probably actually competitive players, right? They play to win. But in the context of this event, they're showing up as fans, right, to watch the pros. So it's kind of like the NBA, where you may play basketball, you may be a diehard basketball fan, but when you go to a Warriors game, you don't expect to like lace up against Steph, right? That's just not why you're there. You're there to watch Steph do incredible things that you can't do, okay? But by contrast, this is the show floor at Evo, and this is what you see in all these fighting game community events. What you're seeing are about uh, four or 5,000 players all competing at <laughs> 30 or so PlayStations uh, set up around the floor, and it's so dense that you can't even see many of the PlayStations. And this is about half of our show floor. Imagine like a whole monitor sort of next to this, and that encompasses sort of what day one or day two of EVO looks like. And so the draw of this event is not to sort of watch the pros, it's to compete against them. It's to uh, participate in an event which, with a huge uh, set of your peers, and test yourself and see, uh, test your limits, see how far you can get into this event, right? So it's a lot less like the NBA, uh, and it's more like poker, 
right? Where if you go to the World Series of Poker, it doesn't matter if you're like a sponsored pro or if you're just sort of a casual player, you go to this event with a winning mentality. You're trying to get as far into the bracket or as you can to maybe make, the, make it money, or, and then maybe if you're a long shot, even to win, right? And so it's a different mentality. Um, so if you sum all that up, I think these uh, are uh, how our events uh, come together. And it's a stadium setting in the end. But all the people that you see in the stands are basically kind of dead bodies, right? Almost all of them <laughs> were players who got knocked out of this event. And they stick around and they watch the conclusion because they love their sport and they're invested. In fact, many of them probably got knocked out by the two players who are left playing for the ultimate championship. Like they have skin in the game. Like this is personal for them, okay? And so these are the three key values that I attribute to the fighting game player, right? There's uh, competition, and especially the spirit that competitors are all equal, and every player deserves a shot at the best in the world. Uh, there's the concept of hype, okay? This fighting games are a 1v1 action genre. It's super emotional, uh, and players love to see what happens to like that dude when he's in that chair, in the moment, up against the wall, and he has to perform. There's a whole like lexicon of um, terms describing hype, like there's salt, the pop-off, right? Players really have almost like a WWE mentality to seeing the action unfold on screen and seeing the, the personal drama of human beings, right? And then there's, this is really a competition, there's the struggle, that, uh, the idea that every single player is always in a personal journey to get stronger, and even if you're a bad player, or a mediocre player, uh, you earn respect for sort of putting your hand to the ring and, and testing yourself. Okay, so uh, part one, over. Uh, so uh, how did the scene get this way? Why is the scene value those three values uh, so highly? And, and part of it is probably that this is a genre that embraces the warrior's fantasy. Um, so many of these games are tied up into uh, martial arts themes, and players are probably consciously or subconsciously sort of bind into that, and so they, they, they tend to value these things. And I think there's some truth to that, um, but I don't think that's the major factor. I think there's something much deeper and fundamental at play, which is that this is a genre that grew up in the arcades. And that was a very specific moment in time that probably won't happen again. Um, and that arcade had a very specific set of rules. And that arena taught players what to value. It shaped their motivations. Okay, and once those players uh, had those motivations set, they passed them down to future generations of players. So that now you have younger players who have never stepped foot in an arcade, never had that experience, but they value the same things. They learn that from sort of their ancestors, and I guess I'm one of the ancestors, which doesn't make me feel great. Um, but what was this experience? What was so special about arcades? Why was it different? Uh, I want you to rewind your mental stack all the way back to 1991, which is the heyday of the arcades. Okay? So this was a full 20 years before watching video games of the internet was a thing, right, with Twitch and with YouTube. This was a long time before the birth of eSports, at least for me personally, which was StarCraft. Right? And this was a full five years before multiplayer gaming on PC was a thing with the original Doom. Okay? So this was a lifetime ago in our industry. This was a long time ago. None of these things were around, but what was happening was a vibrant, competitive scene happening in arcades all over the world, okay? Uh, players were organizing into uh, tournaments, uh, the companies themselves were sponsoring big tournaments, and if you were into competitive gaming, if that was your thing, back then, odds are you were playing a fighting game, because it was kind of the best game in town. Okay, so. Uh, this is a, a really old photo of Southern Hills Golfland, which is a, a now dead arcade that was in Orange County, California. In the, in the US, at least, this was the place to play. This was kind of like the mecca. Uh, this was known to have the best players in the country. Uh, they would hold regular tournaments, and if you were a Street Fighter player, you would come to this place. People would travel from New York, from the Midwest, to play against these players. Um, and when you did that, uh, here's what the experience was. First, obviously, this was a public place, so you had to physically go there. And then you show up with whoever happens to be in the arcade uh, at the time. And when you wanted to play, you'd walk up to one of these cabinets and put your quarter up. Literally put your quarter up on the sill of the machine, right? And that reserved your spot in queue. Reserved, I say, in giant air quotes. Um, but right now you can see like there are four people who are waiting to play. This, this person is putting their turn up and you'd wait in, wait in line. 
And when it was your turn, you take your quarter, you put it in the machine, and you play. And you play against whoever happens to be there at the time next to you. Now, it could be like the best dude in the arcade or in the, or the country, or it could be just a random person. Uh, and the key thing about this um, is that uh, we didn't have things like matchmakers. Um, it was all sort of house rules to determine how uh, you got to play. And so what is on the line for these players when they're going through this experience? Because that's really what shaped uh, their values. And I want to talk about this uh, in terms of three stakes, three primary stakes, right? There's time, there's money, and there's face. When I say face, I mean respect. Respect and admiration of your peers, okay? So let's talk about time and money. Uh, and I want to tell you a story, real briefly, about how I got involved with fighting games with the original Street Fighter II in a putt-putt golf arcade near my house. <laughs> so, I was in high school, I did not have a car, I did not have a driver's license, so merely getting to the game was kind of an ordeal. Uh, I had to either uh, persuade my mom or bribe like a kid with a car to get me to that arcade, okay? So the game itself was a scarce resource. You couldn't just sit down at your computer or whip out your phone and play this thing. It took effort to get there. And once I was there, I had maybe like six to eight hours a week that I could devote to playing games in the arcade, and I had probably $20. Right? Those dollars and those hours were my lifeblood. They determined how much I would get to play this game this week, and how much I got to play the game determined how much better I would get. How much, that was my practice time. Right? So in a very real sense, I had limited lives. And as I'm going through this experience, I'm burning lives at the same time. If I put in a quarter, I lose a little money. If I lose, I go to the back of the line, so I lose maybe a lot of time. That, that time gap could be 20 or 30 minutes before you get to play again. So it was super sharp. Um, and the final factor was that the only way that I could get better, the only way to stretch out those lives, was to win. Okay? That's the only way you're gonna get to play for free, that's the only way you're gonna get to play even two times in a row, is win, beat that person who's next to you. Uh, and what I learned going through this experience, what everyone around me learned really quickly, was that everyone is a competitor. It doesn't matter if you are playing this game for the first time this, this week or if you've been playing for years. When you step into this arcade and you step up to a machine, you have to go in with a winning mindset. You have to try to win. Um, it's sort of a no excuses environment, right? And winning, like, freaking matters, okay? There wasn't such a thing as, like, a moral victory. If you did your best and you almost won and that guy was better than you anyway, so it doesn't matter. You're still going to the back of the line, right? So there's a premium on winning, like, every single time. Um, and so, uh, this was like illuminating and, and like crack for me, and I just really got into it and got involved with it. Uh, and uh, as time went by, um, I moved out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I was, and school brought me to California. And at the time, I didn't know, but I was being dropped into one of the most hyper-competitive, hottest spots for fighting games in the U.S. at the time. And so, I learned a ton about face. Um, and how you earn respect, <laughs> right? How you earn respect among your peers in this kind of an environment, okay? And so I want to remind you that these arcades were public places, which meant that anyone could go, and uh, the, the geog geographical reality of this was that the usual players tended to congregate in the same arcade, okay? So people would go to the arcade in their neighborhood, and so you were always fighting with a group of familiar peers. Uh, and in this peer group, everyone had a role to play. There was like the alpha, the dude who everyone knew was the best. Okay, there were sort of the up-and-comers who were trying to like unseat the alpha, right? There were the regulars who were not, neither good nor bad, but they all just showed up because maybe they liked it. And then there was kind of the fish, right? The, the person who had a, a bottomless supply of quarters, but they always lost, but they always seemed to keep putting them up, right? And they were kind of like the break where you're like, okay, I'm fighting the fish, I can like take it easy for a bit and rest up. Um, and unfortunately, like, local boy from Albuquerque moving up to California full of killers. I was like the fish initially. Um, and so um, I, lost, I lost a lot um, trying to like razor up my skills to be able to compete with these, with these guys. Um, and an interesting thing happens to you when you're in the back of that queue. Uh, the first thing is, remember your quarter's up on the machine. You can't really go anywhere because if you go off and like try to come back in 10 minutes, your quarter will be gone. <laughs> and no one will know what happened to it. Um, and the thing is, if you're smart, you don't want to go anywhere. You want to have like laser eyes on that screen so you can watch that dude who just beat you and maybe learn something, or at least study up on his pattern so you'll have a better chance of beating him next time. 
And so around this arcade uh, cabinet, you have a captive attentive audience. They're captive because they can't go anywhere, or they'll lose their quarter. <laughs> And they're attentive because they want to learn this game, and the only way you can learn if you're not playing is by watching, and watching really closely about the action that's happening on screen. Uh, and this produced uh, a quality of play as performance. Right? It wasn't just about winning, it was about playing for the crowd um, and being kind of a little celebrity around that arcade cabinet. Uh, excellence in play was always respected, but players who were big personalities or could win with style were celebrated. Those were the people that uh, players really looked up to. That's how you earned respect. Um, and there were a lot of players who would embrace this deeply, right? There were players who loved being the hero. There were players who loved being the heel, that, that guy who you just could not stand and he knew you could not stand him. Um, there was one player in particular who, he was strong but he wasn't the best, but he would gain notoriety by being the most annoying dude you have ever met. And when he played you in a tournament and beat you, this is not a joke, he, he had business cards printed, and he would hand it to you, and the business card said, congratulations, you've just been beaten by Jeff Schaefer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so this builds a sense of hype, right? You have this familiar group of players uh, you know these guys, maybe you don't know them personally, but you've seen them every week or every day in this arcade. Everyone knows their spot in the social hierarchy, uh, and their little mini dramas and stories unfold day by day, week by week around this cabinet, like who's gonna beat the alpha? Hey, this dude was terrible a month ago, now he's like beating me, what's going on? Am I a bad player too? Um, and so, um, the familiarity of this builds sort of a sense of drama and hype as you're playing. Uh, and like I said, in this environment, I started off at the very bottom of the totem pole, uh, and I lost a lot. And losing in any competitive game kind of stings. I still rage when I lose in Hearthstone. Um, but in this environment, it was particularly nasty because your losses were public, right? Everybody who was paying close attention to what's going on just saw you lose. And you can't, like, rage out. You can't... Um, steam or say that's cheap because you're just kind of like lose everyone's respect. You just have to like hold that L, right? Keep it inside, put your quarter up and like get to the back of the line. If you don't have that ability, you're just not going to last long in this scene. You're going to get kind of like roasted out of the, out of the, uh, out of the scene. Um, and so uh, what that taught me was that there's a continual struggle to get stronger and you have to be able to absorb losses as like the way you win. The way you win is losing and learning to, from losses and then gradually getting better. And the thing is, eventually you see everyone lose, okay? Um, even that alpha eventually makes a mistake or uh, the, the dude next to him gets lucky and he loses. So it becomes very easy to understand that everybody loses and you just have to learn to suck up and, and, and level up from your losses. Uh, so I learned a lot, I lost a lot, I gradually leveled up in this hyper-competitive group and there was, for me, a sweet, sweet payoff when uh, four years later work took me up to Seattle where I was suddenly in a different environment with a bunch of strong players, but not the world-class killers that I'd been competing against for the last four years. Um, and so all of a sudden I was the alpha, which let me tell you, was a pretty awesome feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's this thing where like you're in this arcade and there are maybe five to eight to 15 people who are all at the same cabinet. If you can potentially beat all of them, maybe not consistently, but if you are good enough to beat every other person in that arcade, you can potentially like go infinite, right? You can cycle the queue, everyone puts their quarter up again, you can cycle it again, and you can play for hours and hours and hours off of one quarter. Uh, and I actually did this a few times. My, my longest winning streak ever was like 73 wins, and it lasted like six hours, and it was just a, a very, very different feeling from uh, every other competitive experience I've had, especially in the world we have now of automated matchmakers with ELO ratings, where the system is always trying to match you up with a fair opponent, which means almost every player kind of has roughly a 50% win rate. Like, this was a very, very different feeling, where even as like a good player, not a pro, but a good player, you could have like ridiculous win streaks. You could be like the lord of this arcade, right? Um, it, it's uh, the feeling of like being the top dog in the moment. Like, yeah, I'm not the best, but like today, right here, I actually am the best and none of you can beat me and you all know it. Um, so that's like super awesome um, and unique and I don't think it has happened since and I'm not sure if it'll ever happen again. Um, so if you sum all that up, you get a culture that is hyper competitive 
uh, but it's also really close-knit. It's social, right? There's trash talking and money matches, um, but there's mutual respect for, between players as adversaries, even for players who maybe are not nearly as good as you, right? And the only way to earn respect in this peer group is to play. It's to play and demonstrate excellence, or it's to play and continue to play even though maybe you're not you know, the top dog, uh, but you're willing to put yourself into that cauldron. So this lasted for like 10 years, um, and it was growing gradually, but steady growth, 10 years of growth. Tournaments were getting bigger. Uh, we were starting to have international events, and it was awesome. It was really awesome. And, and then there was a problem, which was the arcade started going down, right? We were sort of a budding, growing, competitive community. I was on a sinking ship. Uh, when some of the very best, most popular arcades for this scene started to go under, like Southern Hills Golf Land in 2002, the writing was on the wall that uh, this was a genre that was just gonna be dead if something didn't happen. We had to jettison ourselves from, from the arcades. We had to decide what to do. Um, and at this time, there were, uh, there was a resurgence in, on the PC of esports events like I talked about in the beginning of the talk. And uh, to, I personally took a good hard look at these and they weren't really compelling for me personally as a player. Even though the, what they were doing is awesome, they weren't for me. Um, and it goes back to the core value proposition of these events. Uh, are you there, why are you there? Are you there to watch the pros playing at the very highest level or do you want an arena where you, can construct, where you can struggle and compete and test your limits against the best players around? And it was just way more of the right for me and less of the left. And so that was where the idea for Evo came along, right? Evo for me was literally kind of the uh, escape pod that we would use to save ourselves from the dying planet of the arcades, okay? And our mission right from the beginning was to preserve and grow the arpa arcade competitive culture, right? Can we take what's awesome about this arcade experience and put it in a form that can outlive the actual arcades, right? And our values were all competitors are equal, uh, support every player's personal journey to get stronger, and showcase the drama of humans under pressure, right? Restated as competition, struggle, and hype. Um, so we tried, uh, and it was a rocky road. Uh, it, it's been like, gosh, 15 years now trying to build Evo. Um, and we were faced with a lot of hard choices uh, when we were crafting this event. From day one, we decided this was gonna be an open tournament. No matter how big we got, we were always gonna let every player play, and we are gonna put them in the same pool. Uh, and that was easy at first, because we were tiny, right? But as we grew, uh, how do you run an event with 1,000 players? Uh, how about 10,000, right? We had to invest in new systems, uh, new equipment, new staffing solutions to make sure that every player who wanted to play got to play, right? And that came at a cost. We chose to do that in, in, instead of doing other things. Uh, when it comes to the dollars we spend, we have to choose, are we going to invest in more ways to play, uh, free-to-play areas, exhibition, things like that, versus staging, lighting, things that make the event more attractive and feel like more professional. And we've chosen largely to invest in widening the arena for play, because that's what we value. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to our stream production, uh, this one is a really close case, and I go back and forth on this, but do we focus on as much content as we can, gameplay, show more matches, more matches, versus context, uh, showing players' backstories, uh, giving you the knowledge you need to sort of understand what's going on and care about these players? And we've biased a lot of our production towards content. Uh, and the reason why is because these, uh, this is the only opportunity where you get to see a wide variety of play styles from players from all over the world, uh, and people really wanna see that diversity of play. And so when we ask players um, in our sort of audience online, do you wanna see more matches or do you wanna see like, you know, mini documentaries or Q&A after? They consistently tell us, show us more matches, right? And so we're, we try to get creative and find ways to tell that story um, in the natural downtime between matches or over the course of the match. Um, like I said, that one is a, I go back and forth on that all the time, but it's, it's a tough choice that we constantly have to make. Uh, and I think, you know, we've made some mistakes, certainly we've made our share of mistakes, but I do think we've largely been successful, where we have a scene now that genuinely captures what was awesome about that arcade culture. Uh, these players are hyper-invested, there's just a ton of passion, <laughs> right? And the feelings that these guys have for their scene and the competition uh, has nothing to do with the amount of prize money, right? We're not the biggest scene around. Um, it's about 
the authenticity and the value that these guys put on being able to come together and compete and ultimately crown that winner, right? So why does this matter for your game? Uh, I think it's clear that uh, eSports are here to stay, and this is actually, me personally, this is one of the first times where I'm willing to stand up in front of a crowd and say that. Um, anyone who's been around eSports for a while knows it's been kind of a rocky road, it's been up and down, up and down, but I really feel like these, uh, the, the notion of competitive gaming as incredible content and an incredible experience for gamers is here to stay. Uh, and I think in five to 10 years, we're gonna see a much wider variety of formats, of, uh, in, both in broadcast uh, and in eSport than what we see today. We're really at the very beginning of this journey. Uh, and so uh, if you're building a game or an eSport or experimenting in eSports, uh, I want to encourage you to choose a model for your eSport. Don't inherit one. Don't blindly look at what's going on in another game and sort of copy paste it. Uh, if you're a game developer, try to spend uh, the same kind of effort in crafting your eSport that you spend in crafting your game. And when you do that, um, think about what you want your players to value, both from the competition and how they should think about competition, and what you want the players to value from each other, right? And that can help you uh, decide uh, what kinds of you know, rule sets and formats and things like that you want for your eSport. Uh, okay, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, hi, um, Dave Schwartz from RIT. We now have an eSports program there. Uh, as we are building our program, one of the things that we're concerned about is diversity. And I know it, it was a phenomenal talk. I loved your presentation. But I'm sitting there you know, hitting Google women in Evo, and, uh, and I was curious if you could uh, respond to that. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, thanks. Uh, so the, the FGC, I think, is one of the most diverse group of players in esports, except for when it comes to women. Uh, and there are a lot of theories about how we got to be so diverse in, along some lines and not that particular line. Uh, my personal feeling is that it comes to leadership and role models. For whatever reason, the leadership in the FGC, the tournament organizers, the, the people who are out front sort of evangelizing the FGC are pretty diverse. There's a lot of black and brown people who are doing that, and there are no women. And I think when other women see that, it makes it feel like this is not the right place for me, and they go and look at other games. I think um, there's hope here. Um, what's going on with Smash Sisters in particular is super awesome, and I'm really glad to see that they have some success there. Yeah, they're cool. Um, no, they, they, it, but what I want to say is like, it's, if we want to solve this problem, and I really want to solve it, not just for the FGC, but for all of eSports, I think we have to look at get, getting diverse leaders and diverse representatives from eSport. Um, and once we solve that problem at the top, it'll become a more welcoming place for all kinds of players. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, what, you, what do you think games of other genres can do to kind of encourage that competitor mindset and not just the spectator mindset more? Oh boy, so the question was what can other genres do uh, to encourage the competitive mindset and not just the fan mindset? Uh, Right, so there's this paradox in esports and the models that we're pursuing, which is uh, a lot of these games are pursuing sports-based models, uh, but they only look at the top, very top of the pyramid. And if you look at a sport like basketball, okay, uh, there, yes, there's the NBA, but there's a whole pyramid of engagement in, in competitive formats to nurture a player up to the very highest level. There's like the D League, and then there's like all the way down to like YMCA and youth leagues, right? And so you can have success as a competitor when you were young and when you were bad and when you were growing, and that doesn't exist for esports. And so um, if you are a giant esport uh, and you want to help support the competitive mindset in players, I would say add formats for young uh, and budding players. Collegiate formats are great, some of that is happening. Um, how about like, you know, youth formats? Um, just open tournaments where you maybe explicitly carve off the pros because we know they crush everybody, but say, hey, if you want to like get to know what it feels like to be a competitive player, here's an event for you. Um, yeah, so looking at the whole top to bottom solution, not just the top. 
Hi there. It was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as an event organizer myself that runs a lot of tournaments, um, I'm always looking forward to seeing where everything is going. And Evo has been one of those things that's saying, well, what is Evo doing? What games are they focused on? I'm curious on, on a two-part question, which is, uh, first off, how do you guys um, try to be thought leaders in the space? Um, what do you do to try to be thought leaders in the space more specifically to keep on the, the, the edge leading across all the other tournament organizers in the country? And secondarily, uh, where do you see other events needing to be better uh, in order to escalate the major level to bring it up to better for the entire FGC community? Uh, thanks. So if I understand the question, it's what are we doing uh, at EVO to try to stay ahead of the game? Yes. And then what's my advice to other tournament organizers? Basically. Right. Yes. So we don't really try to stay ahead of the game in terms of competing with other tournaments. Um, but what we do try to do is always push the envelope on uh, pursuing risky projects that um, are in line with our values. Um, for instance, uh, we've done things like the Evo Scholarship uh, to try to support the idea of indie game developer and support our players' dreams of ultimately entering the game industry. Um, we now have like an indie showcase where we show like competitive games that aren't fighting games uh, to try to get, again, support for developers. Uh, and so it's really, we're not, we're not trying to like make a million dollars. Um, we're not trying to even be uh, the biggest tournament. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening on the more, I guess, professional, traditional esports side of fighting games with uh, the Capcom Cup and with E-League. Um, those are awesome, um, and I think there's a great space for them. And we're just trying to focus on our area, which is giant open tournament, sort of like the World Series of Poker. Uh, and I guess my advice to other fighting game tournaments is uh, to take the same approach. Find something that you can do better than anybody else um, and then just go hard on that. I think Combo Breaker is a great example of, of an event that's doing that, um, where they have a, their own cool, quirky feel um, in different emphasis than other fighting game tournaments. Um, because when you do that, I think you have a great chance of stumbling on something that is awesome and can explode. Uh, whereas if you're always following behind someone else's footsteps, you're not gonna really have that opportunity. Okay, um, do I have time for one more question or no? Nope, I'm done. Okay, thanks everyone.